We are going to see how positive economy uh, interacts on society with Edel Gott, who is a consultant. Martin Vial, who is the Managing Director of Europe Assistance, and Mr. Frero, who is the CEO of Veolia. Good evening to all of you. So, I'm Didier Pourquerie, I'm uh, the Chief Editor of Le Monde. Uh, which is a partner of the LH Forum. So I would like us to try to talk about the way companies within the context of positive economics can have an influence or can interfere with society. So we've had a lot of examples over the past few days about the way they interact with the world. And now we're going to be a little bit more specific. As just so you know, Antoine Frero and Martin Vial uh, have been involved in the drafting of the report on positive economics. And so they can also talk about that. I will start with you, Antoine Frero, because I would like to know, as the CEO of a very big company like Veolia, what led you to become involved in this movement for positive economics and in the report at large? And so can you give us examples or ideas of how Veolia interacts with a society. Good afternoon to all of you. Well, the reason why I became involved is because of my vision of a company. To me, a company is like the hub of interactions between stakeholders. You know the main stakeholders of a company, shareholders, employees, clients. Sometimes you forget other stakeholders who are not so close but just as important, such as the suppliers or the lenders. And in other words, it's the whole society that the company is part of. And uh, if we want all the stakeholders to interact with one another, they have to find their interest. And sometimes their interests can be different or even in contradiction with one another, so you have to arbitrate. You have to prioritize them. But if one of the stakeholders had no interest, it would leave the company, and in that case, the company would be in danger. And indeed, the company does not belong to each to, to, to one of the stakeholders. The company belongs to all of them or to none of them. And the objectives of a company uh, are uh, multifold. It's not about uh, having just one objective that would serve one of the stakeholders and the other stakeholders' interests would be constrained to optimize this objective. Well, what does this mean concretely? Because we usually say that the company belongs to its shareholders and that its purpose is to generate profit for the shareholders, right? This is the old paradigm, isn't it? And so the paradigm of positive economics is something else. It's that it states that all the stakeholders have to benefit from the uh, activities of the company. Yes, absolutely. And I even want to add that the idea that says that the shareholders own the company is a flawed idea both ideologically and legally. Of course, it would take a long time to explain, but researchers have uh, started to look into that. And it's a, a false idea that dates back only uh, some 30 years or so. But I think that it did disrupt the way companies work. And 
and it misled the companies also. And I'm sure that it also jeopardizes the future of a, a corporation, a company. Um, it's not the first time that one type of stakeholders um, decide to, to, to take over from others. And we need to go back to basics. Because if we fail to do so, maybe the clients, as we start to see more and more, will try to actually take advantage of the company. And if each stakeholder tries to take advantage of the company, well, then the company will die. And so uh, we uh, will be in trouble. Society is one of the stakeholders of companies. Territories are another stakeholder. And you see actually what happens when a company uh, goes bankrupt on a territory. You see the dramatic consequences of that. This is why companies also have to meet the interests of the uh, territory that it is presented. Yes, and this is especially true for Veolia, because Veolia is a company which is perceived as being at the service of society, because you're a company of services, right? And you talk about territories, and Veolia is very closely linked to its roots. So how is Veolia integrated into positive economics? Well, I could give you several examples. Of course, there are some examples which are related to our core business. But I'm going to take one which is not connected to our core business, actually, because my role in the report was to explain that positive economics, which is what I just described, should not be only limited to what I would call special companies, that is, um, uh, social corporations working in solidarity. It's all the economic sector that should be uh, positive, and it means that all the companies should change the, the, their governance. So let's look at skills and competencies and jobs. So it's true that Veolia works with local authorities, and uh, we are close to the field. And today, one of the main problems of France, I think, is the fact that 20% of each age group comes out of school without any skills. This is not new. It's been like that for a very long time. But 20 or 30 years ago, these young people would knock on the door of a factory, and they would eventually get a job in the factory, and then they would get a, a career in that factory. Well, today, this is no longer possible. 20% of each age group, it means 150,000 people, 3 million people over a period of 20 years. If we don't do anything, it means that 3 million people will never get a job. And I think that this might have very damageable consequences. And as it turns out, the jobs of Veolia cannot be relocated. And also, they are jobs uh, in which you can actually acquire skills which you wouldn't acquire in the classical school system, you know, because it's uh, sometimes too abstract or too theoretical. It's not. I'm, I'm not criticizing the school system because it, it, it was like that all the time. But these young people want to work, and they are much more capable of acquiring skills through apprenticeship, and then they can find a job. There is uh, a possibility to give uh, skills and competencies through a whole type of a qualification system in the jobs that we have to offer. And, and these jobs, these uh, jobs which cannot be relocated, have a role to play. This is why this is the only thing that Veolia does. We only recruit apprentices between two and 4,000 of young people every year who come out of school without any skills and diplomas. And we promise them that if they uh, attend a training and get the diploma, they will have an open-ended contract with us. And so it started in France. We have six training centers. And then this is also extended to other countries where we operate. We could do it differently. We could um, hire people who are fresh out of uh, school. We could steal them from competition. They would already have been trained. But we have decided to make this specific effort to train them, to give them a job, a passport for life. And this, I'm sure, contributes to solving part of this uh, societal problem that we have, which I think is one of the most uh, striking that we have. But it's not specifically 
linked to what we do. Well, of course, the fact that the jobs have to remain local is a key factor. But anyway, this is something that brings civil society and the territories that we operate in an additional service, which makes us more useful, I would say, useful to society. Oh, and I'm happy that you're mentioning this example because maybe some people in the audience were already here yesterday or attended other debates. It's like a light mot motive for this year. 150,000 young people who come out of school without a skill or a diploma. Henry Lackman yesterday talked about this. And Yes, and it's a light motive because uh, it's an obsession for some of us because not much is done for them. The contrat de génération, those new contracts uh, created in France, are only valid for uh, fresh outs, people who come out of school with a degree. But the problem is those people who come out of school without anything. Martin Vial, you were a member of the committee that worked on this report on positive economics. Now, you are the... Uh, CEO of Europe Assistance. So what is your role in the movement of positive economics? Mr. Frero's example was <coughs> very much in line with the question. So what, what, what about you? What about your company? What's your approach? Good evening to all of you. First, I have a belief, a very strong belief, to answer your question. It is that companies will have to uh, take up the consequences of their social footprint, if you wish. And this is something that we expressed with a certain number of French CEOs two years ago in a book that was called The Social Footprint. And it is exactly what Antoine Frérot was saying a minute ago, and I'm sure that this is no coincidence. And uh, we have this belief, you know, in my job as a CEO, this is a belief that we see uh, more and more of because it is, of course, a commitment and because the rational altruism, as described in the report, totally applies to companies. It's a trend. And uh, if you look at the environment, for example, preservation of the environment. When I was a student in a business school, we were only starting to talk about uh, insourcing the negative externalities. That is, the fact that companies actually pollute and left or leave their waste to be dealt with by society. Well, in 30 years, what's happened is that now we are in an economic system in which we ask economists to uh, reintegrate their uh, externalities. And this is what my neighbor here is doing. This is a perfect illustration of that. We now have an economics of CO2. <laughs> and uh, this is a perfect illustration of this. The second example, we are an international corporation present in 33 countries. We have branches, subsidiaries that serve local clients. And we also serve international clients, tour operators, credit card uh, operators who have a global presence. And more and more, when you have uh, an international call for tender, you have ethical criteria, environmental criteria, CSR criteria, <coughs> which are becoming more and more present. So you see that the business world is itself committed in that trend. So let's not be naive, because we still have a long way to go. And in the uh, committee, we talked a lot about rational altruism. Yes, could you tell us more about this? Because it's a very beautiful concept, but sometimes it's got fuzzy lines. Uh, it's very unclear. Well, it's everything but charity. It reminds me of an old debate between uh, liberalism, where the Collective uh, optimum is the sum of all individual optimums. Adam Smith, you know, the invisible hand. 
the major crises that capitalism has gone through have demonstrated that this doesn't work. And what we're seeing right now, which is a mutation crisis, shows that you cannot consider that selfishness. I'm not, I'm not talking morally, but I'm talking about the fact that somebody would first want to fulfill his or her personal interest versus the uh, general interest. The sum of individual interests it does not work miraculously, and this has been perfectly illustrated by the crisis. So um, rational altruism means, as I said, it's everything but charity. It's not about charity. It's the idea that it's in everybody's interest to take care of everybody else's good and welfare because then he will improve his own individual satisfaction and the collective satisfaction. Now, how does this apply to companies? Well, it makes perfect sense. And Antoine Ferro uh, said this very well. It's the fact that uh, companies' success cannot be based on only financial success for the benefit of the shareholders only. Either you have all the stakeholders which have been mentioned, and also we see that this rational altruism applied to companies has uh, is sometimes applied for wrong reasons or for right reasons, for good reasons. The wrong reasons. If you are a polluter and you have a very uh, criticizable ethics, you know, if you employ children, you know, we are present in China, India, Brazil, Russia, and if you don't comply with the local laws, with the international laws, universal laws, basically, universal human laws, well, then your e reputation is going to be damaged. You know, you remember the uh, Apple um, campaign. But, so that's the wrong reason. But still, it means that companies are going to pay more and more attention. They are going to try to uh, actually internalize this uh, social footprint in order to not be seen too negatively. And But then there are also positive reasons. For example, if you share the value that you create with your clients, they will be loyal to you. The retention rate will be much higher than your competitors' retention rate. If you treat your employees uh, respectfully, if you respect the laws and if you make sure that your employees' employability and well-being at work is at its best, well, of course, you will have people who will be more innovative, more engaged, more productive, and, and the same goes for suppliers and creditors, etc. So that's the positive reasons. And of course, the, I make the connection with the long term, but the idea is that this concept of social and societal footprint can only be measured in the long term. And it's not the share price by the quarter or by the day that should lead the strategy of the company. It's the long-term vision. And seeking long-term results uh, in order to create wealth, to create values, and not just financial value for all the stakeholders. Could you give us an example of how Europe Assistance implements this in practical life, an example of rational altruism? Well, we signed a long-term partnership with Ashoka, which, as you know, is the leading network that promotes the development of social enterprise. Why this partnership? Once again, I'm not placing myself in a charity uh, vision. I'm placing myself in the vision of my company. My company, Europe Assistance, was created 50 years ago 
on the concept of medical repatriation. And then we uh, started uh, our activities of um, automobile assistance, which is a fast-growing activity, especially in emerging countries. And now, lately, we have two profitable growth relays, which is health services in your daily life and um, personal and household services. Now, in order to be able to supply these services, uh, which are very local by definition, we use service providers in a very um, um, local networks, you know, nurses, uh, home aides, sometimes doctors, etc. So these people work in networks. And we do this at the scale of the world. Well, we don't do it in all countries yet. But already, in, it's something that's available in most countries where we operate in the northern hemisphere. So in order to be able to do that, we need to have more and more connections with small companies that will provide these local services that will be very close to the end user. So in our partnership with Ashoka, we support the creation of fellows, social entrepreneurs. Ashoka calls them fellows. Uh, we have targeted them in the area of health and personal services. And these fellows will join our network and um, make it richer. We help them grow. We help them uh, build their capacity, and then they can become part of our big network. Well, this is very pragmatic, yes, and it's also very consistent with what Mr. Frero was saying. That is, every time it's about interacting with society in order to uh, work together. So this is really something that goes both ways. Now you were talking about rational altruism. Edel Gut, you're a consultant in an area uh, which is very much in line with what we said, which is ethical leadership. Could you tell us how your action comes on board in this approach? Well, we do see a lot of possibilities uh, to go out of the current situation. But of course, this is going to take a lot of commitment. It's not easy. But there are a lot of possibilities. If I look at the um, old conventional paradigm, which is inconsistent, which is difficult, which is aberrant, which is conflictual, which generates a lot of suffering, I wonder, really, and I think there is a problem somewhere. And when you look at the fact that you could actually feed 12 billion people, and as it turns out, 2 billion out of the 7 billion population are actually starving, there is a problem. There is something wrong here. What's wrong? We don't want that. Nobody wants that. And when you see, for example, that uh, half the population, while we have all the means to take care of our body, our health, our well-being, half the population is going to have cancer, and 50% of the population already has some kind of invalidating disease. Well, you know, when I see this, I wonder. But actually, all those things are the result of all the decisions that were made, all the choices, all the options that were taken, all the orientations. So in other words, all this was really at the heart of the strategies, at the heart of the system. It is in the uh, core of the reactors. This, uh, uh, we inherited this system with all the organization, everything that was transmitted, all the pressure, all the difficulties. Actually, we find ourselves in the middle of this. So the solution is really to uh, take one step back. I mean, to really step back. And this is very, very difficult to do. 
uh, because we always need to face the instant to we are constantly under pressure we constantly have to do something so it's uh, uh, extremely difficult but I think that it's the price to pay we need to take some perspective and also to accept to open up to a global vision and to see everything, to look at everything, to see real life, to see the real problems, um, the problems of everybody, and then see how we can bring answers, taking into account the real problems of the real lives of real people. You know, basically, the problems that we experience and which are not in line with our fundamental needs. So ethical leadership is about taking into account in any strategy, any orientation, to take into account the fundamental needs which we all have in common, which are universal and essential for each human being at all levels, at all levels of the corporations and in all possible situations. So, of course, you can always think, oh, but what are those needs? Well, those needs are basically to be healthy. Everybody needs to be healthy, right? Uh, to be safe, to have a good, well-balanced life, to be respected, to respect others. That's basic stuff. But it's also the fact to have access to knowledge, whether you're in Africa, Asia, America, Europe, elsewhere, you all need all of this. You also need to include everybody, not only include minorities. You need to include in your thinking um, all the factors. And uh, there shouldn't be any interference or guilt or anything. It is re we really need to see where we are. We don't need to judge. We just need to find out where we are. And we need to see what the real effects of what we do are. And also, we need to fulfill ourselves and to be able to uh, uh, come up with a good project, contribute to society while fulfilling ourselves, while enjoying ourselves. And so we introduce, introduce this in companies. And actually, we realize that it generates motivation in the companies. It mobilizes uh, the people, and it is something extraordinary. The people feel recognized. They feel valued. They become uh, real players, stakeholders. The company leaders reinvent the companies while keeping their feet on the ground. You're, they're not moving any faster than what the reality allows them to do. So starting from there, step by step, you need to open up and to reinvent the company and create a company that really uh, answers the social economic needs uh, of uh, all the stakeholders. And then you can find that you go further than that. You see uh, the medium and long term. You see that you are consistent. And then you go beyond what you thought you would do. An example of intervention. Uh, can you give us an example uh, um, coming from uh, your company, uh, for instance, in Africa? I can give you one example, uh, an operation we carried out some years ago for a pharmaceutical uh, company. They had huge problems with their subsidiaries in Africa, in uh, 14 countries. They were about to withdrawing all drugs and closing down all subsidiaries in those 14 countries because in the last six or seven years, they had no results. And under such conditions, uh, when we arrived there, we uh, advised them. And if we had just a financial look, uh, um, it would not have been possible. So we uh, looked at the, the overall situation. We had uh, uh, this uh, human dimension as well. Uh, we uh, put them, we, we, we examined the whole situation. And we uh, met uh, some uh, obstacles. We wanted to make proposals. We said, uh, let's uh, start again some uh, plants, uh, closed plants. Uh, let's produce uh, generic drugs. Uh, but they 
just wanted to sell strategic uh, products, uh, the most expensive products. Of course, you cannot uh, sell those drugs in developing countries. So th their response each time was, it's not possible. Uh, what you are recommending, what you are proposing, it's not possible. Um, uh, they, uh, we have outsourcing. Uh, we, uh, so uh, it's not possible to... to, 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 to so we said uh, we, it's possible to negotiate. We're going to help you. And step by step, I can uh, assure you, and with the right language in uh, respecting the level of threshold, uh, we, uh, we um, listen to all intermediaries. There was a diversification, uh, something cr uh, very creative. How can we do this? How can we do that? They started to negotiate with the governments. They were uh, really in conflict with uh, the governments because of their positioning. But uh, this, uh, we reserve, reversed the situation. Uh, the, the company became an advisor to uh, the governments. Uh, within 18 months, we reversed uh, the situation. The COMEX uh, uh, came for the first time to Africa to celebrate uh, the success stories, and uh, the general manager was appointed uh, uh, was uh, by a magazine, uh, the, the Young Africa, as a, a manager transforming uh, the situation in Africa. So we had ambassadors in the company. All uh, employees of the company became uh, stakeholders, and they were proud of the company. They invented a new company. This is rather interesting because this, I don't know what you think of that, but the three testimonies, the three stories here uh, go uh, along the same line. Uh, that is to say they have uh, two major components. Uh, positive economics uh, is at the same time uh, around values, building values, but at the same time, it is very concrete. And uh, it is uh, uh, beneficial um, for the company. So I would like to thank you very much, because uh, uh, the three of you, you made uh, the effort uh, to be not only in the theory, but uh, you showed us examples and uh, it uh, help us understand uh, some uh, concepts uh, we have heard uh, uh, during those two uh, days. It has become more concrete. Thank you very much.